As I complete this module, what I want to, to offer to you is a proposed methodology. Now, I want to emphasize it's a proposed methodology for interpretation. It's not something which I'm saying to you, this is what you've got to use, and you'll find an outline for this proposed methodology in your notes, in, in the lecture notes for this particular module. But I want to start with something to say to you that what we're trying to do, and certainly what Paul wanted to in, get, encourage uh, Timothy with when he wrote to Timothy, he said that all Scripture is inspired and useful for, and this is the part where we need to hold on to, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and leading into all righteousness. It's, it's understanding that Scripture was there for a purpose. It was the purpose of growing us in discipleship. Now, of course, what's happened with, as the scholars have got hold of, of the, the, the scriptures, have got hold of the text, what they've begun to do to a large degree is to separate the spirituality of the text from the text itself. And when you read a number of commentaries, you will be struck by, especially by some commentaries, where the concept of faith or of spirituality or even a relationship with God doesn't seem to be applying to the text. I want to get you to guard against that. I believe that the first step in any methodology for interpreting Scripture is in order to pray. Is that we pray, we start this process in prayer. Is that in every time when you approach the Word, that you approach it not because it is verbally inspired even, or because it is completely true or infallible or unshakable. No, you approach it in prayer because it is the Word of God wanting to speak into a life lived in God. And as we live that life in God, so we seek to read His Word and understand His Word to us in a way that reflects that relationship. So I would want to move on the concept of relationship first. And how does relationship work but through the process of prayer? That as we come to God and we say to God, help me illuminate my life, allow the Holy Spirit to work through you and through me in order to be able to apply this word, in order to be able to understand this word. My sister once gave me a little book of, of pithy sayings. And the last saying at the back of the book, which I'll never forget, says, ask God's blessing on your work. But do not also ask him to do it. And I think that applies to exegesis and hermeneutics. Yes, we need to start with prayer, asking God to help us as we investigate the word. But please don't think that somehow all we have to do is to sit there and then God will give us the answers. In fact, what we need to realize is that we are part of the community of scholars and of Christians throughout the ages who have looked at the word. And by virtue of that, we need to realize that they too, as they were inspired and encouraged, and as they too showed forth their relationship with God through their interpretation, so we can then learn from them. And in fact, we need to learn from them in order to give the Holy Spirit the tools to actually enlighten and give us wisdom as well. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing, of course, is to read the text. And not just read the text once, but read the text multiple times. One of the things that happens as you read a text multiple times is you begin to realize that there are certain parts of this text which seem different or that maybe certain words will, point, will, will jump out at you. Uh, it's the opportunity to, to make that text part of who you are. This is a point now where, in fact, a lot of times you can also use other versions of the Bible. Just like in the last, uh, the last uh, clip, we talked about the different translations. Sometimes it's a good idea to then read different translations of the Scriptures. So to read the different versions. Now, you might not have access to the different versions, but if you do have access to the Internet, almost all the versions that are available are actually available on the Internet for free. If you're looking for the NRSV, for example, you can go to a website called bible.aremus.org bible.aremus.org you don't have to put www in front of it just those and you'll get to the NRSV and you can you can have a look at the NRSV or the new revised standard versions uh, understanding of the particular text it also can work as a concordance so a concordance is one where you type in a word and it finds all the occasions in which that word is used in that particular translation. 
Another one which you can go to is called is www.biblegateway.org. Biblegateway.org. And that's another one which will get you access to things like the message, the NIV, and a number of other translations as well. I want to encourage you to do this, to look at different translations, because one of the things that will happen for you very quickly is you will see that there's a lot of similarity on one hand, but then there are particular differences. And I want to encourage you to look at those differences, to actually look at the fact that there are different ways to translate the same words. And that that's important as well in terms of using or connecting with what a passage may mean uh, and what that meaning can, can be for you. So read the text many times. Read the text in more than one version or translation of the Tanakh. After that, I would encourage you to, again, spend some time in meditation. To spend some time allowing that word to speak to you, to allowing that word to, to, to become part of your soul, to even begin to use your imagination. I think one of the greatest undervalued resources we have in biblical interpret interpretation is our imagination. Imagine the scene. If you're reading from, from Joshua or Judges, or, or if you, you're imagining what the kings and Samuel were like, then actually put yourself into that space. Imagine the scene happening. I guarantee you that sometimes, even in your imagination, you will see things that weren't immediately obvious when you read the text. Maybe the text left them out, and that's important too. Because in a text, it's not only what is written, but sometimes what is not written that is as important in, in terms of interpreting and giving that text some understanding. The next thing you need to do is you need to work out what you don't understand from those words. Sometimes in the English there will be words that you don't use often in your normal language. Go and find those out. Use a dictionary. Uh, if you don't have access to a dictionary online, a particularly good one is one called www.dictionary.com. Seems very simple. www.dictionary.com. Type in the word there and it will give you a number of different interpretations of those particular words. It's a very good way to do it. But don't just skip over a word. Don't just say, well, I don't know what that word means, so I'll skip over it. Because often the words that you don't understand could be the key word to understand a particular passage or verse. So understand the words. Work out what those words mean and connect with them. Once we've done some of that work, we need to then ask some of the questions of the text. And these are the questions that go back to our, our clip concerning the actors and the stage. You're saying, what are the characters? What are their main characters? What are they trying to do? What is the, what is the author wanting to tell us? What is the context, the sociological context in which this is happening? What is the tradition that it's teaching us? And here you can use some of the tools of criticism, the different critical tools that we apply. The one tool that I apply most often when I read the Bible is, I call it the strange tool. And this tool is the one that says, what is strange about this text? What is wrong in this text? Uh, and when you look at what's wrong in the text, sometimes that can be an interpretive principle too. So for example, in the story of David and Goliath, it says that David knew that Goliath had this huge javelin and really all he needed was one throw and David was gone. So David really knew himself that he also had one swing or one sling of his, of his particular sling and then what would happen? He'd be dead. And yet when he goes to the stream, he doesn't pick up one stone, he picks up five stones. Now if he knew he only had one shot at this, why did David pick up five stones? It's those illogical things. It's those things which we question within the Bible that often are the things that can unlock, can, can open up particular stories. And when we open up those stories with those strange things, using that strange tool, I think that that's when we begin to maybe uncover some of the, the hidden treasure of Scripture. So we need to ask the right questions. One of the biggest questions we have to ask is why? Why is that written like that? Why did that story happen like that? Why is he using those characters? Why are they acting in that way? When we ask those questions to the text, maybe we can begin to dialogue with the text. And not only with the text, 
but with the Spirit who is helping and guiding us through that text. So asking the right questions. Then comes the opportunity to then stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before. To stand on the shoulders of those scholars and those people who've done all that, that work in Hebrew and Greek and have gone and done the extra mile within, the, in, within culture, tradition and so on. So to look at a commentary, to look at commentaries about the particular passage and to work through what they are. Out of that, we can then draw together the main points as we see them. And once we've got those main points, we can begin to then have a sense of what is the meaning of this text. The next step is the hardest one. And that's the, then to apply that text into your context. Saying that, yes, in the Fijian context, we don't have sheep. So if you don't have sheep, then how do we understand the image of a sheep within that context? Well, that's when we have to take those concepts of what is a sheep like and transform them and apply them into a new framework. It's like taking one of Shakespeare's plays and translating it into Fijian. How do we make the, the jokes that work in English, how do we make them work in Fijian? Well, with lots of difficulty and lots of work, but it's not impossible. And in fact, that's the, the process of biblical interpretation. Now, you can't do that until you understand the joke in English. Once you understand the joke in English, you then can translate it into Fijian. Finally, you need to ask the question, so what? Remember that the Bible was not written just so that we would have something to put on a shelf and gather dust. The Bible was meant to be a, a handbook. It was meant to be a guide. It was meant to be the guide that helps us develop in terms of our discipleship, in terms of our understanding as the people of God. It's no use having something like that if the people don't know it, if the people can't connect with it, and more than that, if they can't live it out in their lives outside. What we always need to realize is that interpretation is no use unless it can answer the question, so what? So what does this mean? So what does it mean in terms of how I live my life? So what does this mean in terms of my growth of relationship with God? So what? I pray that you may enjoy the process in the methodology of learning to interpret Tanakh.